please have your seats. The Honorable Kay McConney, Minister of Education. The Chief Education Officer, Dr. Ramona Archer Bradshaw. Dr. Ida May Denny, Director of Education Transformation. Mr. Stephen Jackman from BAPS. And Mr. Curtis Luke, members of the head table. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and that means all of you, good evening. I trust that you're all doing well this evening and we're grateful that you've decided to carve out a portion of your most valuable resource, your time, to be with us this evening for our public consultation on the education transformation proposals. My name is Raphael Saul, honored to serve as your host this evening, and I'm looking forward to a robust and a rich discussion as you have the opportunity to share your input, give your ideas, make your suggestions and recommendations on the proposals that have thus far been submitted. It was just a few weeks ago that we were at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center for the launch of these education transformation proposals, and a commitment was given then that there would be a series of public cons consultations giving members of the public, like you and I, the opportunity to give our feedba feedback and input into these proposals. And I think we can say that thus far, the minister, the chief, and the entire team at the ministry, they've made good on that commitment to have these public consultations, and so I'm grateful to have your presence here with us. To kick us off this evening, I'm pleased to welcome the Minister of Education, the Honorable Kay McConney. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come out here to share your thoughts, give your advice, add your input, um, ask your questions, and do all that you need to do to fully appreciate what these proposals are and to help us to find out how best we, one, what should we go forward with, and two, how best we can go forward. I believe we are all here because we want the best for the children of this country. And the two are interlinked because education runs through as a thread throughout everything we will do to build the kind of global citizens with Bajan roots that we are trying to create and to ensure that this country remains competitive in a changing world. A bright future for every child is the theme under which we have located these proposals. And we did that because we wanted to ensure that we build an education system that serves all children. And we wanted to ensure that the kind of supports and the quality of the education we provide will ensure that every child believes that he or she has the opportunity that they have a chance to truly develop to their own potential. And when we talk about a bright future for every child, if your child is gifted, academically gifted, or gifted in music, or gifted in sports, or gifted in science, or gifted in any number of different ways, we want the opportunity, and these proposals you will hear provide the opportunity for that child, that gifted child, to be able to keep pace with the way they learn and to accelerate their progress through the system. And if your child is a child with some challenges, you will hear some of the proposals whereby we are seeking to start earlier with diagnostic testing in a number of different areas to ensure that when we do move forward with this child, we are able to design interventions that are suited to their particular exceptionality and that we are not guessing at how to intervene. And if your child is a child that learns differently, for example, you may notice that your child is a child who learns best by doing. We want to build the kind of system 
that will ensure that our teachers are able to identify the learning stern by hearing and discussing and working. Every child has a different learning style. And we want to be able to identify that child and then help our teachers to be able to adjust the way they deliver instruction that is most suitable to that child's learning style and to that child's multiple intelligences. And if it is a child that might get lost in the system, we want to put the right kinds of assessments, the right kinds of curricula, the right kinds of training in place to ensure that that child that might normally get lost, that we are able to find that child in a mixed ability class, in a class where children of different abilities work and that the teachers are properly trained for differentiated instruction so that children don't get lost, they get seen not only because we recognize how the child learns, but because the teachers are equipped to be able to identify and cater accordingly. The intention is that we build a system that will address the needs and serve all children, however they learn, at whatever pace they learn, whatever their interests, whatever their strengths. And you will hear a number of proposals that will speak to these. One of the things you will learn is that education transformation is about how we improve the quality of instruction, not only through the training of teachers, but through their continual develop, professional development. You're going to learn that education transformation proposals, it is also about school leadership. How are we preparing our school leaders to lead schools in the 21st century? You are also going to hear that education transformation is about curricula. How we design the right kind of curricula that is suited for the times in which we live and that will help prepare children for the real world, a world that is very different than the world in which many of us in here grew up when we left school. We will hear that education transformation is also about looking at the legislation and recognizing that our legislation is outdated and that if we want to create the environment for a 21st century living and education, that we need to look at the legislative and regulatory environment that helps to create that. And we are going to learn that infrastructure how we deal with what, how, how schools look physically, how collaboration and flexibility, how we design the schools for climate resilience, that much of that is part And I will not go into the others because the technical will go through each, each pillar of education transformation one by one, but I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that education transformation is much broader than simply allow children to transition from to secondary. And there are some exciting proposals and I really want to hear you weighing in and asking questions. So with that, I am going to turn over to or Master of Ceremonies, um, who will lead you through the rest of the presentation. This decision that we have to make about education transformation is not a political one. It is a national decision. It is a national decision. And I am going to take the opportunity to just step aside and allow the technical people guide you through this process. I'm here if there's any um, specific thing you need from a government perspective at the point in time. I think that you will get tremendous value from the presentation at this time. Mr. Master of Ceremonies, thank you so much. Incredibly grateful to you, Honorable Kay McConney, our Minister of Education. It would be remiss if me if I did not acknowledge also the arrival of 
the Honorable Sandra Husbands. Thank you so much for joining us. At this time, I hope that everyone has a copy of the proposals, and you'll also see an FAQs document. Does everyone have that? I think it will be very useful to have that in hand as we transition now. And I invite the Chief Education Officer, Dr. Ramona Archer Bradshaw, and the Director of Education Transformation, Dr. Ida May Denny, to lead us through an overview of the Education Transformation proposals. Allow me to hasten to say here, this is not intended to be a long lecture where you sit and listen passively to the explanation of proposals. In fact, after their overview, we get to the real meat of the night, where you get the opportunity to give your input, your recommendations, share your concerns, and your ideas. So Dr. Archer Bradshaw and Dr. Denny, I hand over to you at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Saul. It is indeed a pleasure to be here this evening to share with you our education transformation agenda proposals. As Mr. Saul said, our are going through each and every proposal with you. You have the booklet. You can go through the booklet and you can see many of the proposals in there. For those of you who are watching from at home, I encourage you to go to the website www.mendvespokeindepth about the fact that we engaged a number of persons on the idea of reimagining education. We spoke with principals, teachers, parents, students at the secondary and primary levels. We spoke with unions. We spoke with the NCPTA, faith-based organizations, and the list goes on and on. We are now at this point where we will share with you some of the key proposals um, that are originated from those very robust and in-depth discussions. As we discussed, there was one thing that was absolutely clear, in fact, four. We said that we need to build an education system that gives every child a chance at a bright future. We said that we need to teach every child the way that he or she learns best. We need to inspire our children to, act, to excel and to achieve. And we need to produce outstanding Barbadian citizens who can compete and do well anywhere in the world. We came up with the acronym FIRM. We said we needed to have an education system that was built on a firm foundation, one that is fair, to all of its partners in education, one that is inclusive, one that is relevant, and one that is modern. And as we discuss the proposals, the questions were asked, is it fair? Is it inclusive? Is it relevant? Is it modern? So this acronym undergirded many of the proposals that you will see here this evening. And why do we want to have such a firm foundation? Because at the end of the day, we want to create a child, a citizen who is global and who has Bajan values. We want persons with character, persons who are confident, not afraid to speak their minds in a respectful manner, persons who show initiative, persons who not only consume, but who produce. Given the fast-paced environment in which we live, we want persons who are adaptable. Many of the jobs that exist now did not exist when I was 10 years old. In fact, when I was 10 years old, I don't even remember internet being as ubiquitous as it is now. And I can list off all of the jobs associated with the use of the internet. So 
we want the kind of person who can change and who can move with the moving times. We want our children to be problem solvers. Those kinds of children who can look at a problem and come up with homegrown solutions. We want critical thinkers. All of this will redound to a globally competitive nation. Because we will have citizens who demonstrate the character, the confidence, who demonstrate that they can cooperate, and who will have distinctive competencies that will give us the competitive advantage needed to navigate this world. We want our children to be equipped with critical skills and to have quality livelihoods in this 21st century. But again, throughout all of the discussion that we had, as we were reimagining, as we were visioning, we said that there's a big problem. All of what we really want, we don't have. Because the system is not adding value as it should. I will now turn over to Dr. Denny, who will share with you um, the main areas of focus. And she will now go into the proposals for the pre-primary, primary, and secondary levels. Secondary levels. Thank you, Chief, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As the Chief said, we recognize that our system was not adding value as it should. And therefore, if we were going to transform the system to make it provide for the needs of every child, then we had to have a strong focus across the entire system on a number of things. We had to have a strong focus on competencies. Very often, we judge children on how much they can regurgitate. We felt that we not only needed to know what children know, but we needed to know what they can do. We need to see what they can do. So we needed to place strong emphasis on competencies. We also needed to place some emphasis on social and emotional learning targets. Our emotional intelligence speaks to who we are. It guides us in terms of how we have relationships with other people, how we treat other people. But following the closure of schools as a result of the pandemic, we have noticed that we have children who don't seem to have those um, characteristics that tell us they're emotionally intelligent. Our children don't seem to care for one another as much as they used to. They do not have the attitudes that, that, that says to us they respect their elders and so on. And we believe that a lot of this has to do with the absence of the social interaction, which is a part of face-to-face -face school. Therefore, we felt that we needed to place some emphasis on social and emotional learning. We also recognized that we needed to establish clear performance standards at each level. Our system must not focus as much on where children go to school as much as it should focus on what do the children know? What have they learned? Have they grasped the curriculum? And therefore, performance standards are critical. We also recognize that we are living in a very small world now. And that we cannot prepare our children to live in Barbados only. But we must um, 
prepare them to be global citizens, notwithstanding the fact that we want them to remain, to, to retain those Beijing characteristics. We also recognize that our system has spent a lot of time focusing on a summative examination and a lot of our children are missing gaps. They have gaps in their learning. We recognize that we can address this by ensuring that we do regular continuous assessment. We also recognize that early screening and diagnostic assessment is going to be very critical if we are going to address the needs of all children. If at the beginning of a child's school life, we can identify those things that prevent the child from learning, then we can address them there and we can have children remain on track rather than waiting until later to find out that they have certain disabilities when they would have fallen further and further behind. We also recognize that in this, as I, I, I referred to uh, earlier, in this smaller world in which we are living, we need to collaborate with people who speak languages other than what we do. And we recognize that if we are going to make our society a multilingual society where we can communicate with the people who live not only in this region of the world, but across the entire world, if we are to encourage our children to become entrepreneurs and develop their businesses in other parts of the world, we have to make sure that they can communicate with these people. And therefore, we recognize that we must expose them to functional foreign languages. And when children are very young, they are developing parameters for language learning. And the more languages we expose them to at that time, the more likely it is they're going to develop them. And therefore, we recognize that functional foreign languages had to be included in our curriculum from the very early stages. We also recognize that many of our students proceed from one class to the next, from one teacher to another teacher, from one school to another, and very often the teachers don't know what they're coming with. And therefore we felt that every time a student moved, that student should be accompanied by a profile that tells the teacher, this child has these strengths. This child has these weaknesses. You need to focus on X or Y with this child. So those were the general things we felt needed to be done across the board um, in basic education, that is at the pre-primary, primary, and primary levels. But there are some other things that we felt needed to, needed to relate specifically to each of those levels. At the early childhood level, we recognize that there are some students who fall behind when they get into formal school because they have not had the exposure to pre-primary education. And that is largely because we do not have enough places in the system currently to have universal pre-primary education. So we have determined that that is a goal that we are going to try to achieve within the next three years. Every child in Barbados between the ages of three and five will have a place in public education. We are also going to ensure that all of our pre-primary children are ex exposed to a play-based curriculum which allows them to develop the prerequisite skills that they require when they come to formal learning. 
At the primary level, we are going to introduce a project-based approach to teaching and learning. Our children need to develop the 21st century skills that are required for uh, success in education and for going, going on with the world as they grow older. So we are proposing that we expose them to project-based approaches where they cooperate, they engage in teamwork, they collaborate, they communicate with others, where they demonstrate their critical thinking skills, where they get the opportunity to expose their, critic, their, their creative thinking skills. And they develop this body of skills that make them complete citizens. We also recognize that at the primary level, we need to introduce individualized education plans because we have a number of children who are either at the bottom of the scale who need to have programs that are specifically planned for them. But we also have gifted children who, because very often we are teaching to the middle, they also get left behind. And many gifted children get bored when this happens, and they become disengaged and begin to give trouble. So we propose that we are going to be developing individualized education plans to address the, the issues of not only those children with disabilities, but also those gifted children who we need to keep interested in school. At the secondary level, we are proposing a new way of transferring children from the primary to the secondary level. This way is going to be a feeder school um, system where we take primary schools that are in the vicinity of a particular secondary school and we transition all of the children from those primary schools to that particular secondary school. Now, there may be reasons why you may not want this to happen or, way, or why it cannot happen in your particular situation. We are going to have a built-in, we are proposing to have a built-in mechanism, a pellet mechanism, where parents who have difficulty in getting their children to that particular catchment school, they can appeal and an independent body will look at that request. We also are proposing the introduction of two new schools. This is going to mean that the pupil-teacher ratio at the secondary level will be smaller, and it means that your children will be able to get more individualized attention. There is also a proposal for a two-tiered structure where we have junior colleges of excellence, which are going to be, are going to have children between the ages typically of 11 and 14, and senior colleges of excellence, where the ages will be between typically 15 and 18. And let me give a little explanation about 18 years old. 18 years, the only children who in the system right now go to 18 are those children very often who are doing cake. I see Mr. Douglas Corbin, who used to be the principal of Ellerslie here. Mr. Corbin used to very often let a number of his children go to 18 because he recognized that some of them were not capable of doing such a large chunk of subjects in where they were writing eight subjects at one time. And he made a commitment to those children, I am going to let you write three or four, 
but I'm going to let you come back and write another three or four so that you end up with the same amount as those children who were capable of writing eight at one time. We have to give our children, all of our children, the opportunity to achieve regardless of whether they are bright and they are capable of handling large chunks or whether they are slower, they're moving at a slower pace, but they can succeed if we give them manageable chunks. And therefore, we are proposing that all children be given the opportunity, if they desire, to go to 18 so that they can do CAPE, they can do... CVQs, let's say they've done CVQ level one and CVQ level two is available in school and they want to go on to that, they can do so. But we also want to give the opportunity to the children who are moving at a sore pace to graduate from school with some certification. There are other proposed initiatives that we are looking at well, we propose to enhance our system of our system and school leadership. The ministry needs to be organized in such a way that it can efficiently and effectively manage the system. And therefore, we are, are looking at how we can do that. In addition, we need to ensure that the persons who are leading school are two of the legislative hurdles they have been um, put in place already and we now have to develop a service commission obviously this has implications for how we deal with teaching uh, issues in the system everybody has to line up at the door of the public service commission right now and sometimes that means that issues relating to teaching and teachers are held up over a long period of time if we can put the teaching service commission in place then we are going to be able to cut down the time we spend on a lot of these issues we recognize also that there are some teachers who are simply interested in teaching but because, like everybody else, they would like to get a higher salary, they move on to the administrative stream and become deputy principals, principals, and other school leaders, when in fact that is not really what they want to do. We believe that the introduction of a master teacher track, which compensates these people appropriately, will help us to retain some of those in the classroom. We recognize also that parents are critical factor in the development of their children and therefore to implement a number of parent education programs that will help us to work on getting our children where we want them to be. And of course, we recognize that partnerships must be engaged in there are this is a very lofty um, proposal in terms of what we want to do for our children what we want to do to transform education it costs a lot of money and the government cannot do it on its own and because we are doing this in the interests of Barbados we have to develop partnerships, both local and international, so that we can have that bright future for every one of our children. Thank you. So you will, so you will see on the screen the roadmap for 2023 to 2025. We started with our consultations um, in earnest from May this year. 
uh, we began our professional training, starting with our education officers at the Ministry of Education. Uh, we had um, professional development sessions with principals as well, as deputy principals. We are now having our public consultations, and these will continue until November. After we've heard all of your input, we will incorporate that input into a final draft cabinet paper and then present that paper to cabinet for their approval. So we are hoping for approval in January 2024. By February 2024, we should have received the report on the Ministry of Education audit. At present, we have a consultant who is conducting an audit of all of our physical and human resources and everything that we would need for an education transformation. So we will have that final report in February and we are proposing the implementation of the education transformation policy for 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, all of that to say that we are very excited to hear your feedback on this. I want to make it absolutely clear that this document is not a fait accompli, or the document that you see on the website is not a fait accompli. This document is very different to the one that we had in July when we met with the unions and um, the NCPTA, Future Barbados, and other stakeholders. And I'm sure that the document that we will have in December will be quite different to what we have now. So I'm asking you to feel free to come to the mic and ask your questions, uh, make your comments, offer suggestions, because at the end of the day, we're each of our children. So thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Paul. Thank you very much, Chief Education Officer Dr. Archer Bradshaw and Dr. Archie Denny, Director of Education Transformation. This is a consultation. And so we are to open the mic on both sides of the aisle for all of you to make your contributions, share your ideas, your perspectives, your concerns. And as Dr. Archer Bradshaw and Dr. Denny mentioned, these are proposals. I think it is important, therefore, that we seize the opportunity now presented to us to give our own input we'd like to see. If you're like me, you may be a parent, you may have small children wondering what the future of the system will be for them, or you may have nieces or nephews, friends, neighbors, maybe you're here representing someone you care about and you hold dearly, and you want to make sure that these are heard. I invite you at this time, the mics are in the aisle, I'd ask when you do come up, please just identify yourself, give us your name, and then feel free either to pose your question to a specific member of the panel up here, myself excluded, or, or you can make your contribution, or you can make your contribution openly, and any members of the head table may contribute as appropriate. So to my left, I see a lady standing at the mic. I'd ask you please just to tilt that microphone down towards your mouth. It's pointed a bit upwards. We don't want to lose any of your contributions as you make them. Please, I invite you to go ahead. Hi, good night everyone. Um, I am Nicole Howell. So let me just introduce myself a little bit. Um, I did my first degree at UE, KPhil, and then I did my master's at University of Roehampton. Um, while I was at UE, I remember doing a course with a professor and the manual wasn't so well, so it was very fine, like typewritten and single spaced. And what we did, me and another student, colleague of mine, we actually typed over the whole thing, sing, um, double line, and we, we produced every, um, every format or diagram the, the professor had and just put it under his door for the other students. This is why I'm here, actually, because I care. And I'm here to just give my suggestions, and I'm hoping that they are accepted. Um, I am just gonna say, I'm gonna give the before reform 
during reform and after reform stage. My before reform stage is we need to get into the international arena and workplaces to find out what is necessary to really carry out business. Some um, people, um, they have a lot of inefficiencies and you know, reading would have been one of them. Um, also in communicating and stuff like that. Um, I want to go into the reform. While we reform, I just, gonna, I just took some notes, um, wrote some notes. Um, sorry. Right. Um, sorry about that. So while I um, dealing with the right, so we looked at the how does the workplace acts, and not only for Barbados but throughout the world. And remember, we are artists and stuff now, so I've seen that we are, you know, in the trend and stuff like that. Are we only aiming to reform academics or the entire person? And this is something that's very important. Um, in 2014, I would have, um, those of you who may not or may know, I would have been the person who developed Roundabouts of Life board game. Now it was, um, it's in several schools, churches, community centers, the Barbados Entrepreneurship Foundation used it and stuff like that. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is not only have um, each household having a degree, Instead, each household having a, a job, <laughs> a specialist, you know? And remember that we need somebody to still do our plumbing, our mechanics, our, you know, tiling our building. And so we aim to look at developing the entire person. As a result, the game, which is played on the map of Barbados, is actually used as a tourist product as well. It has several, several, several different cards to cause, to jog person's memory, to jog person, to shock the children's um, development as the person. It's when you get $200,000 for getting a degree, you get $200,000 for getting a skill. And when I land there, I usually ask when I'm doing a demo, what would you do? What skill would you take? What degree would you do? You know, so that we get them thinking. And I'm saying now, um, in the primary schools, I think we wait too late to develop our children. In the primary schools, we need to start pushing this. And um, for those of you who may not know, I have a son, he's 29 years old, and he travels all over the world on behalf of Barbados. But from age nine old, he was cooking, cleaning, everything, and he was buying his school clothes and everything because I had already trained him. So that by the time he got into secondary school and he's, you know, trying to mix with the others, trying to fit in, you know, it's not necessarily, um, you know, I want to say, because sometimes they, they go into the wrong company. So I, I had tried to push these things from, the, from as early as possible so that by the time he's trying to rebel and stuff like that, I would have caught it and he nipped it in the bud. So he's Chef Travon Stout, as people may know. And so, you know, that has helped him tremendously because he travels all over the world on behalf of Barbados and, you know, things like that. Looking at the entire person, we are looking at um, join reform. Who will give feedback? Where is the feedback going to come? Are we going to just say, "Oh, this is it, full stop"? Are we going to keep reforming? Are we going to keep tweaking? That's something that we need to look at. And after we reform, who will protect those that were reformed and that seek to put what they learn into practice? And I want to give my particular experience. I work in government for the last 29 years now, and to be honest you learning and going into the workplace to try to implement what I would have learned would be like, who the f you are? <laughs> you know, you get bullied, you get like, keep her down, she thinks she's too much, you know? How do you deal with that after you've worked so hard to be reformed? You know, what do we put in place to make sure that reformation is definitely um, in place? I am particularly, um, I, and I brought this up with my leaders at PRDS, sorry, and PS recently, as to when we just um, went and gave these two solar energy students scholarships to go and learn 
when they go back into the workplace, who's going to embrace them? I mean, you know, we accustomed doing this. Who you, who you think you are, you know? Put him in his place. What happens? Who protects those persons that have been reformed to come back to try to lead and to guide? And I'm very, very interested in this particular aspect because these are our future leaders. And I would usually say to my MPS's leaders, um, remember that we can have a bonus. I used to tell my son, Boots, in case I don't live to see you grow, make sure that you can stand on your own, right? And by 11, he was standing on his own. You know, he said, mommy, mommy, but you told me, and, and I'm standing on my own, why are you? So my thing is that we can have a bonus to see our leaders leading while we are still standing, while we, while we are still working before we lie down, and then here there's one I ask. So that is um, some of the things that I would have made. Um, just give me one minute, please. I'm just going to just give you my last points in reforming. Um, okay, while, while you're looking at, at, at your other points, I would like to thank you, Nicole, for your suggestions. Yeah. Uh, because it gives us an opportunity to reiterate certain um, proposals that we have in the booklet. Mm -hmm. Now, you ask whether we are reforming academics or whether we are reforming the whole person. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to make it absolutely clear that it is about transforming the person. Mm -hmm. As I said before, we want to have a global citizen with Bajan values, somebody who has character, who has mm -hmm. confidence, who, has, mm -hmm. who, who demonstrates the critical skills of which you just spoke. You said that we wait a little late to introduce certain skills mm -hmm. at the primary level. And as part of the transformation, we are putting forward technical and vocational skills as a mainstay of the primary curriculum. You also, by making your point, um, on the fact that parents are critical to this education transformation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Denny said it um, a few moments ago. She said that parental involvement is something that we as a Ministry of Education crave. Your son, you spoke about your son, was able to reach the level that he has reached because he had the input of the education system and the input of a very good mother and a very good family structure. So as a Ministry of Education, we recognize we can't do it alone. We need the input of all of our partners, including parents, giving us the opportunity to reiterate that point. Yeah, so my last point is Yes, don't mind. I accustomed. Don't worry. <laughs> um, I would like to. The game has um, the Roundabouts of Life board game. It has, as I said, I am reintroducing it again. People, some teachers shelved it because it includes reading, and some children want to get to the finish as early as quickly as possible. And sometimes we miss the whole point of life because I can't wait till I get 16. I can't wait till I get 18. I can't wait till I get etc. instead of enjoying the journey, etc. And so because it takes a little time to read, some teachers kind of shelve it. I want the Ministry of Education to help me as I try to reintegrate it back into the schools, as I try to develop the whole, the entire person and the entire leader for, um, for our future um, transformation. Nicole, I'm, I'm, going to have to, I'm going to have to ask you to stick a pin there. Mm -hmm. We're grateful for the contributions you've made thus far and the opportunity that Dr. Archer Bradshaw has taken to respond to those comments. In the interest of making sure that this large and robust crowd that has gathered here has an equal opportunity to make their submissions, I'm going to kindly ask that you defer. If there are any other things perhaps you'd like to raise, maybe you can submit those separately. But I want us okay. to make sure we have appropriate time to allow everyone to share. And as our next uh, attendee comes up, I want to invite you, please, if you can, keep your contributions as succinct as possible. We're very grateful for this large crowd, and we want to make sure this is truly a consultation and that we don't have any individual or any group of persons taking a significant portion of time uh, because, of course, our time here this evening is limited. So, Nicole, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, very grateful. We do have a lady standing to your right. I want to invite her to come and ask her question. Oh, I'm sorry. So, ma'am, 
pardon, just yeah. before just before you go, there was a lady standing behind you, but I did not I did not see her. So I want to invite her to come up. Once she's finished, yes, ma'am, you can make your way. Just to make sure as you get to that microphone that it's pointed directly to your mouth so we don't miss any of your contributions. And ma'am, you've just sit, you've just had your seat. I want to invite you to come immediately after she has completed. All right. Thank you so much. And we want to keep this speed and pace of contributions going throughout the evening. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Minister and all honorable members at the head table, ladies and gentlemen. I would have come here to say that I have written, it's here, about 600 pages long, a complete essay or book on educational change. It deals with specifics. Your proposals, and I have admired them, are global. They appear not to be, but they're global, and they're good. They're very good and a very good effort. But what I have done is not only to point out minutely what is wrong with the present system for the last 50 years, but I have written precisely an idea of how it should happen. May I say that since 1958, or is it 56, when you had independence, educational change was uppermost in most people's minds. But they missed the point, and they missed it up to today. Because the reason children do not learn is not being taught in the way they ought to be. Nobody has asked the really crucial question when it comes to educational change. Every time something is wrong with the educational system, a social answer is given. No more of this, no more of that. Everything is social. But the reason children learn, the reason all of us learn, is because we receive stimuli from the environment, and our brains receive them through our senses, our brains process them. And I have written this in the way we ought to go about teaching. It is called integrated thematic sequences. Everything is hierarchical. I have cut out disciplines. I have cut out the timetable because they are all wrong. I have cut out everything that is done, put them into a new parcel. And I admired what was said at the head table, that schools have not been designed for teaching. They have not been designed for teaching at all. All we have are pods and cells. Whereas, the arrangement should be very different. And there should be teachers teaching. There should be all the teachers involved in the teaching of the concepts. I don't know why my legs are shaking, but then I am a 19th century person trying to speak to 21st century people. But my book, which I hope to take into the ministry, explains in detail. May I say one more thing? Just one more, ma'am. Yes, please. Just one more. I do not believe in emotional, what's it called? Emotional intelligence. It doesn't really exist. I could explain it, but not now. What we need to do is to allow the children, and you have said it, to be taught through play. But the play, the play, must be thought out carefully, it must be guided, and the environment must be set. But when the teachers come in, everything is in order, and it's not expensive, it's cheap. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am.
I saw Dr. Archer Bradshaw taking copious notes, so she's noted your contributions. Yes, I invite you to go ahead and make your submissions, ma'am, and I like the pace that we're going at here. Vain. Yes, my name is Jeanette Vaughan. I'm a retired teacher. I taught at a primary school, but I understand the importance of primary education. Madam Chair, uh, members of the high table, ladies and gentlemen, I refer you to the mission statement. Equipping students for lifelong learning, quote unquote. What is, what is clearly understood here is that reading is a prerequisite for such. As a matter of fact, the major problem in education in Barbados today is that too many students leave primary school not being able to read. When we address that problem, everything else, everything else will fit. We don't have to worry about, you know, putting every subject that there is on the curriculum in primary school. The point is, when children transfer from primary to secondary, you, you've equipped them with the literary and numeracy skills. You've equipped them with the skill of being able to think critically. And they can do any subject they want to do. Um, I would have, ex I'm disappointed really that not enough is given to primary education. The focus seems to be on the secondary stage. We've, we've heard quite a bit about that, you know, school, two new schools being identified. And according to a recent report in the nation, design plans have already been submitted, which is very good, you know, things are moving. And there's much excitement about these plans. But what are we hearing about the, um, the, the schools that are to be built for the pre-primary? It is true that you did admit in three years' time, every student should be accommodated. And that is a goal to, um, to work towards. If that is done, then teachers in infants A and infants B should have an easier time teaching children to read because they'll be coming from um, pre-primary with the reading readiness. At the primary stage in infants and infants B where reading is taught. I would have thought that there would have been, um, that there would have been some, some ideas thrown out, some, some suggestions, you know, some plans about what is to be done in those classes. The res our resources should be placed right there at the bottom where reading is taught. We should have small classes. We heard about um, two new secondary schools being built and there will be small classes at the secondary level, smaller classes. But in infants A and infants B, you need small classes to facilitate teacher-student, more teacher-student engagement, and certainly for the teacher to be able to spot those students who are lagging. And I'd like to suggest that for class one, you have a teaching assistant. The idea there would be to Spot any student who, who might have a little difficulty, you know, and get things moving. Education reform is a massive undertaking. I must congratulate those persons who worked on the booklet, you know. Um, it's a massive undertaking in terms of management and in terms of expenditure. And I'd like to suggest that, th that stage one, that it be um, carried out in phases to avoid chaos. And that the stage one really should be reinforcing the foundation in um, infants A and infants B. So that children, children will go up to first form, class one, being able to read. Thank you very much for your contribution. Ms. Vaughan, it's been duly noted. Please don't stand as yet, ma'am. The gentleman had raised his hand earlier to indicate that he'd like to go next, so I want to invite him to do so. 
Thank you so much. What you could do, if you are able to do so, before you begin, sir, please pardon me. If you're able to do so and you'd like to make a contribution next, it might be useful for you to stand in line behind the microphones. That could be helpful. If you're not able to do so and you flag your hand to me, I'll do my best to monitor those hands that are raised and invite you to do so as much as possible. Thank you so much. And sir, you may go ahead. Good night, everyone. Um, my name is Saber Nakuda. I am an author, historian, and a researcher. Um, as you know, we have had the African strand. We have had the European strand. And now, for the past 110 years, we have the Asian strand, or the East Indian strand. And the way East Indian, for the last 110 years, have played a important role in nation building, whether it has to do with commerce, whether it has to do with professionalism, doctors, lawyers, or whether it has to do with culture, and, um, uh, uh, and it has to do with uh, our folklore. Because as you know, since 1930, the children in Barbados were singing about Coolie Man, House of Fire, and so on. And we had other uh, input that has to do with East Indians, whether it has to be with uh, Ali Singh or whether it has to do with uh, Mark Fingal and his Indians, or it has to do with um, uh, 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 Steel Donkey, etc. So I wish to say that we have been, for the past 110 years, playing our part in nation building. And what I would suggest now, that as we are at a stage where we are faced with a bright future and we are working towards a bright future, I believe that, that, that the history of the East Indians in Barbados should also be included within the curriculum of the future plan um, that we are going to have for the education system in Barbados. And uh, the, the, those in charge do not really need to go far to get the um, a rule resource book, because I already have the resource book here. I would be more than happy to pass it on to the Ministry of Education, and they can take a uh, look at it. And because this is the book that took me 15 years to write, and it is the most comprehensive history of the East Indians in Barbados. And so therefore, I would like to urge again that the, this book, or uh, the history of the East Indians, should be included in the future plan for the education system in Barbados. I would also now like to present this book. I don't know whether the Minister of Education is here, and also the uh, Chief Education Officer. So. Uh, I do not know who shall I present this book to. Yes, so sir, I think you can feel free to pass it over. Um, I, I want us to make sure that during our consultation, we are mindful that we want to get as many as you've done initially towards the idea that ought to be incorporated in our educational transformation discussions. Should you have any other business you'd wish to conduct, of course there is opportunity for you to do that. But I want us to make sure we are very streamlined in what we're doing here, and I would not want to open an irresponsible floodgate that causes us to be derailed in any way in our discussions this evening. So please, I invite you to feel free, you may pass that over. Uh, there, there will not be an official presentation ceremony though. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I must feel, I feel impressed to, to emphasize that. No problem. Uh, but who, but who we are grateful I? for your willingness to serve your country in this way, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Olton, I'm going to ask you just to hold on for one second, please. The lady who is, who is about to stand and take the microphone, she's been there for a little while. Then I'd like to come over to Mr. Olton. And then there's a lady in red who is standing um, in the aisle. I'll be happy to come to you thereafter. Or is Mr. Lashley still there? Yes, he is. He is. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michelle Cave. I'm a teacher. I'm an author. I'm a communicator. I'm a muralist. At the moment, I'm creating a mural in Heyman's Market, put on by the 
it was funded by the American Embassy. And the person who designed the mural came with an Amerindian and a bunch of black women in a cane field. I said, no, <laughs> that is not Barbados. It's not a representation of Barbados. It has to be more than that. You have to see the European. You have to see where the, the black women and black men have gone to. And you have to show the Indian and the Chinese and everyone else that made us. So yes, we are being represented well. The first thing that I want to say, I'm shaking a bit because my legs just got pins out, but don't worry about that. Dr. Denny, we need English as a second language in the primary schools. The social and emotional learning, particularly intelligence, needs to be taught to the teachers and the principals first. Then the students have a chance of having it. Now, the third thing that I want to really put forward is my absolute disdain for all schools being put into this zoning business. There are some schools when you walk into them, you feel learning taking place. You have not been taught anything, but you feel the presence of learning, the presence of excellence, the presence of, I am going somewhere. There are some schools that don't need to be put into the zoning business. I'm not gonna say the names, but all schools have not been created equal. They have more resources than some. They have more, um, teachability, they have more, they have more, they have more in the business of learning and teaching. I will write the rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lashley, I realize you've just risen. Mr. Mr. Olton is on his feet already. I'm going to allow him to make his contribution. And then Mr. Lashley, you can feel free to go, to go after he has finished. And I know Mr. Olton is going to honor our commitment to brevity Whoa. and conciseness Whoa. as he makes his contributions. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Namari. All confidence in you, Mr. Olton. Sure, good evening. My name is Tony Olton. Um, I am the founder, uh, amongst several things that I'm involved in, the founder and chair of an organization called the, the Caribbean Institute for Social and Emotional Learning. Some members of my team are over here. So you can tell where I'm going with this, with my contribution to the uh, exercise this evening. And to suggest to you humbly that social and emotional learning has to be at the core, has to be at the center of everything you attempt to do in education transformation. So before I put on the table what my suggestions are, I think I would want to get a fuller understanding because when I read page three, page three is you're saying we want to develop an emotionally intelligent child. If you look at all of these elements, those are the elements of an emotionally intelligent child. And then you specifically treat to the characteristics of emotional intelligence on page 18. What are the targets? So page three and page 18 are essentially saying, saying the same things. So if you could for a couple of minutes um, give a fuller sense as to what you understand, what you intend in terms of social and emotional learning. If you don't mind, please. Yeah. Dr. Denny? Thank you, Mr. Alton. When I was making my presentation, I talked about the fact that we, we are a country in which we have traditionally raised our hand to help others. 
now we are seeing children who seem to have a cold streak to them. They don't seem to care about anyone else. They have a difficulty respecting elders. There are things that when I was growing up, for example, that we would not say in front of our elders because we understood these were people we had to respect. A lot of that seems to be missing from our children nowadays. There seems to be little compassion. A lot of the bullying that takes place suggests that children don't care for others. We had a consultation with children on Monday. Well, two really. We talked to the primary students and then the secondary students. But coming through from both interactions, children talked about other children who made fun of children with disabilities and things like that. This says to us that there is some lack of emotional security in our children. And we want to get that back. Because if we can get that back, it means that the school alone, the school is not going to have to work alone to help get all of the children to the place that we want to get them. Their peers are going to see themselves involved in that process as well. So therefore, that is why we view the development of social and emotional um, skills as critical if our children are to develop into the adults that we want them to be. A significant part of the challenge then you're going to have is that we spent the last whatever number of years teaching geography, mathematics, physics, chemistry, home economics. We've helped students to understand to some degree some aspect of life outside themselves. So a person is an electrician or a mechanic, they can manipulate aspects of life outside of themselves. We've not taught over the years our students to understand the world taking place inside of themselves. And therein lies our most fundamental problem. And so those students are their parents and grandparents who can't transfer those same social and emotional skills that you're asking for. So one, social and emotional learning must be at the core, at the center, must be the foundation, the bedrock of everything that you do. It can't be a class that you send disruptive students to. Every teacher, Every member of the ancillary staff, every administrator, the people who are selling on the school premises, the persons who are running the canteens must themselves, and I agree with the person who spoke earlier, must themselves become emotionally intelligent. One of the things we teach in emotional intelligence and social emotional learning is that an emotionally unintelligent adult cannot raise or contribute to the raising of an emotionally intelligent child. This has to be a whole system. Indeed, it has to be a whole country approach. What I'm envisioning is not just education transformation, but a renaissance of this island that we call Barbados. So all of us have got to be engaged in this whole process of education reform, and specifically social and emotional learning. I just want to share one little thing that I think would help you to understand how we feel about this. We've had the opportunity over the last three years to engage teachers, principals across the island and, in, and outside of our business. To start our, our engagement, we asked three questions. What are the emotions necessary? Sorry, what are the emotions uh, most prominent amongst students? What are the emotions most prominent amongst faculty? And what are the emotions that are necessary for learning? you might find this instructive. And I took down one of those, the responses from one of those workshops that we did. Emotions amongst students, anger, that was the number one. 
frustration, unstableness, disappointment, exasperation, frustration. You see where we're going? Confused, depressed, intolerant, hatred, disinterest, indifference, insecurity, sadness, fatigue. I don't care how much English you teach or geography, learning cannot take place if those are the emotions that are predominant amongst students. Then we ask, what are the emotions, so you can see we did a, it's a word cloud. What are the emotions most prominent amongst faculty? Ready for the list? Tiredness, indifference, frustration, anger, disappointment, anxiety, some flustered, burnout, boredom, exhaustion, demotivation, discouragement, impatience. So you have students who are turning up with what you would otherwise describe as negative emotions. We teach that emotions are neither negative nor positive. You have faculty turning up who are having their own issues. And then when we ask what are the emotions that are necessary for learning to take place, same, same body of respondents, curiosity, passion, joy, trust, um, happiness, joy, peace, and happiness, contentment, optimism, excitement, concern, enthusiasm, comfort. That's the challenge you're already facing. How do you get faculty to turn up with a mind and a spirit that is secure and is able to make connections with their students and bring curiosity, passion, happiness, focus, enthusiasm? Until we get this right, until we treat the human being their needs, their emotional needs, until we help our children to become self-aware, self-motivated, self-managed, to develop a, a, a greater capacity to connect with others, to understand where other people are coming from, and to, to, to think about life other than about meeting their own needs, until we get there, as your people used to say, we will just be spinning top in mud. Thank you, Mr. Olten. Thank you so much. Very strong contributions, and we're grateful. I'm going to go to Mr. Lashley. Uh, over to my left, Mr. Lashley, I see your notes, and I know you'll keep them concise, sir. And then allow me, please, ma'am, I did, I did promise you, but allow me to come over to the lady who's here, who's been standing here for a while as well, and then we'll come back over. Thank you so much. Mr. Lashley, over to you, sir. Thank you. I'll try to jump straight into the... Go for it. Right on. Um, with the advent of the internet, we were, we, we were able to partially diagnose our own issues. Um, if you feel a pain or whatever, we, the internet tells us, well, you know, we both, that we, even before we seek to go to a doctor, we have a, a good idea what might be wrong. And if we are well enough informed, if you're well enough informed, we might even know that what will cure this is some amoxyl, or what will cure this is some um, paka paka pain, or whatever it is. You might even know that yourself from the internet. But you can't go to a druggist, you can't go to the pharmacy and give me some amoxyl or give me some paka paka pick. They'll tell you you need an authorized prescription. So you still got to go back to the doctor, even though you may have a good idea what's wrong with you. They have that, that built in structured protection. The teacher, on the other hand, has no such protection. If you are able to go on the internet or use AI or what you use, and you register for some CXCs privately or for a degree wherever privately, and the internet helps you to pass, you don't have to go to you don't have to go through the formal school system to get your CXC or your degree. We don't have that protection, that legal barrier that says you must come through the teacher. So the teacher, just like the motor mechanic, with the advent of the electric car, has to recognize your job is under threat. Your, your original job is under threat if you don't make some changes. If our mechanics in Barbados don't change, they can become one of the most unemployed set of people around. Because as every, let me, let me quickly, let me quickly go forward. So the teacher doesn't have that protection. So what do we do? Cry, tell the students, don't bring those things, don't bring no essay that you went on the computer and get AI downloaded. You can't, you can't do that. Because you can't hold back, it's like trying to hold back a birth. 
of a child. You, you can only do it so far. Eventually, it will come gushing out. Eventually, um, students are going to be writing essays. And, uh, and, and, th and in this regard, in, in this regard, one good thing is that Barbados, Canada, America, whoever, stand equal at the starting block. Because the challenge faces every nation right now, every educator, wherever you are in the world. So that puts us all, small country or big country, as equal. I think there's a good thing and a bad thing at coming back to the starting blocks with all the big nations beside us. That good thing is that we could win. We could jump first. Why not? We got this. We ain't get raised by multiple, multiple choice, no insult to no nation. We ain't get raised by multiple choice tests. We ain't get raised by makeup tests. We had to bust with brains for anything that we passed in the Caribbean. And we are used to sending children from Barbados, whether they went to a top school or middle school or even lower school, to overseas. And next thing here, this body putting the honors list, this body making the dean's list, this body topping the class. Because in Barbados, it's really going to nothing, right? To pass exams. We don't get given passes. We got work done here. So when we stand right now, facing the challenges across the globe with AI, I have a good, strong feeling. If we do it right, we can lead the world. Trevor Eastman, Trevor Eastman say, clap for that. Here's an, there's another topic they won't go into right now, but he needs our help, though. He needs our help. You, you can go. You can go ahead to your, to your next point. Yeah, thank, um, you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No problem, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, we, we need to examine in schools, and not only in schools, but across our society, even in churches, this false divide between the secular, between the formal, and or the worthwhile and the secular. Churches do it well. The, the, the churches have a strong divide between the sacred and the secular. Um, churches are not unheard of. Having all prayer meetings on Independence Day or any day at all, a nation is doing other things because they consider that what they're doing is holy and what the rest of us do is unholy. Schooling has made a similar error. We have not focused our attention on, on schools on issues that are surround us. We have not asked questions. We have not taught our students to ask deep and disturbing questions about our society. And as we build, as we rebuild, we have to go down into the foundation and have the courage to dig up and face skeletons. I'm talking about skeletons that are sensitive and bothering. I'm social divide. I'm talking about how on earth can I have fast food chains across Barbados, making millions and millions of dollars monthly, and the VH, even up to yesterday in the news, is, is crying out and saying, if you come to the QH and you're not at the point of death, I'm very sorry, you're going to have to wait long. Up to last weekend, we had the LS chain, um, but two programs, in fact, talking about the judicial system in Barbados, full of a backlog of cases. And every backlog of cases, every issue that is not dealt with, every file that is not expedited, is an actual fact a person's life circumstances that you're dealing with. Mr. Lashley, you're making some strong points. What I'd, love, what I'd love you to do Stop is just... And French and geography. Education ought to teach us to look at social issues and ask ourselves deep questions. And AI, rather than seeing AI and the computer as an enemy, it is a good friend. Because the computer can now spend its time teaching them things. Where we deal with some other bigger issues that make for the better Barbados, that make for racial harmony, that make for class harmony. And by class harmony, I do not mean that everybody in Barbados is supposed to be given $15,000 in their pockets and say we made it equal. I'm not interested in that. But, however, though, we must set a bottom line. We must ensure, for example, that we aim at every Barbadian or rather, no Barbadian needing to go to sleep hungry. Can we at least say it has a bottom line? That, no, that we in Barbados have abolished hunger? 
Thank you. Th th thank you very much, Mr. Lashley. You're making some great points, and we're thankful for the contributions that you've made. We're, we're indeed grateful for those points. Allow me to come to the lady who is standing in the aisle right here. Thank you so much. Just give us your name, please, and then you can go right ahead and make your contribution. Sure. My name is Joy Sharon. So good evening, everybody. Good e evening to um, the senior ministers on the table. Um, yes, I've got an English accent, but, <laughs> but both my parents are Barbadian, and I'm living in Barbados now. Um, so I'm an educator and a trainer, and I train teachers and parents how to teach children to effectively read and write. I'm often asked to train teachers in both the private and public sector as teachers express a need for these important life skills. The discussions around transforming education in Barbados are critical. We've heard lots this evening, and it's been interesting to hear uh, the proposals. Um, but there's also been some speakers who have also mentioned uh, the role of reading and its importance. One of the major areas that I've heard little about is how is the teaching of reading and writing being addressed within the transformation of education in Barbados? And that will be my question, but I'm going to continue for a little bit. For many years, there's been disagreement amongst academics about which method is most efficient when teaching children to read and write. Due to these reading wars, many children have left the education system disadvantaged, unable to read, as methods that were used were ineffective at teaching all children to proficiently read and write. Some may argue that these children may have reading difficulties. However, I offer an opposing view that perhaps those children have not been taught in a way that accommodates their way of learning. Rote methods still abound in our schools alongside the basal readers like Lucky Dip that warrant children memorizing texts alongside picture cues. Methods like, I'm going to show you a word, say the word, and have you say what I say. So if I show you the word and I say the word is dog, you repeat after me and say the word is? Dog, right, okay. And that's what we do to children. They just need to memorize it, okay? Um, some children may not even look at the word when we say to them, say the word is dog. So what are they really learning? Let's turn the tables. And if I said to you, this is the word cat, remember the word cat, okay? Because it's, we're using symbols that are unfamiliar, we are now challenged and in the position of many of the children who are expected to memorize words every single day. For children with a specific learning difficulty, they are already at a huge disadvantage as they face working memory challenges. The popular method of teaching word for man and fam, teachers always find this quite interesting. So we say we're learning families, and because we can, most of us, read, don't take it for granted. All right, because we can, we think it's easy, so we say that's man, this is man, this Span, we expect children to remember. But when we use the word family, where is it based? It's based at the end of the word and not the beginning of the word. So we're not teaching children to read from left to right, we're teaching children to read from right to left. And then we wonder why they might be confused. Work for a time for some children, the deficit has been developing over time. It becomes apparent when children reach class two, where pictures disappear and technical vocabulary takes center stage. We see many more children struggling to read. I just want to share a bit of um, research by a lady called Nancy Young. She's a Canadian educator. So, Joy, I'm going to have to ask you to do it's Joy, correct? Yes. Yes, what I'm going to have to ask you to do is, if we can allow uh, Dr. Archer Bradshaw, Dr. Denny, to respond to that question you raised a bit earlier in your contribution about what is included for the teaching of reading and writing. Allow them to respond to that, because I don't know if we'll have the opportunity for you to segue into the research and data you may have. If there is an opportunity for you to submit that, though, subsequently, I think there, there may be an opportunity for that. But I want to give the opportunity to respond uh, to that question, uh, lest we have to transition and they're not able to respond to that. Thank you so much. OK, thank you. Joy, thank you very much for that question. 
agree with you. Reading is fundamental. How are we going to tackle it? We know that there are some teachers who cannot teach reading. So we have to first fix that. So we've engaged artist and teacher training college to offer continuous professional development workshops for our teachers specifically focused on the teaching of reading. That is one way. We also recognize that there is a need to create a culture of reading within our schools. Primary schools in Barbados that have reading clubs, not all. The principals will tell you that I encourage them to have as an extracurricular activity reading clubs or have it as a lunchtime activity. Because our children are very accustomed to tablets and cell phones and playing games. Some children don't understand the importance of learning to read. They don't even like to read because it's not anything that is fun and exciting and colorful. So we have to create that culture within our schools. Additionally, we are exploring relationships with regional and international organizations in terms of that reading. So it is not a one-pronged approach. It is a multi-pronged approach. And I have an officer here, education officer, Little. she's smiling because she knows that. You she, can raise your hand, Miss Little. She knows, me. she knows that she has been tasked with boosting reading across all primary schools. It is a concern for us, and we can't wait until 2025 to fix it. We have to start fixing it now. So we've begun to make some inroads in terms of ensuring that we have a reading population at the end of the day. Can, can I respond? But very, very briefly, Joy. Yes, very briefly. Of course. Um, so one of the things, because I have teachers who approach me for training, I have schools that approach me for training, and one of their concerns is that they're not actually getting the practical skills that they need to be able to teach children to read. They're learning the theory only, which isn't equipping them when they're in the classroom. I know that lady earlier on said that teachers are not equipped to teach the skills, and it's not a criticism to teachers. It's saying that their training at the level of initial teacher training is not meeting the needs of them being able to uh, teach children to read in the classrooms. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Joy. And please, please don't see me as impolite. If I ask you to keep your contributions concise, it is just that this is a consultation, and you've all come to give your contributions as much as, of course, can be accommodated in the time that we have. So I invite you to do that and do so concisely. And I, I remember at the launch, the Prime Minister mentioned that though Mr. Jones, Ronald Jones, our previous Minister of Education, was not able to attend, he sent a 125-page document with his submissions on education transformation. If you've come this evening with a 125-page document, kindly give us the executive summary, and I believe you can feel free to submit the other 124 pages at a later <laughs> date, with all due respect. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Hines, and I figure you all want us to dissect what you've written. Um, I just have a few questions and perhaps a few solutions. Um, I've read your proposed curriculum, and I 100% agree with you that we need to start with the young people. My question is, I mean, you have a lot of things which I, in a class recently, even said is necessary in pri primary school, entrepreneurship, coding and robotics, and the like. But I find that we in the Caribbean, I won't narrow it down to just Barbados, but we in the Caribbean tend to be too theoretical and not very practical. And I think, first of all, y'all would be very surprised how many children already can teach your teachers coding. My children can teach your teachers coding. I think my son knows three different or four different ways to code. He taught himself on the internet. 
Um, so, is this going to be a theoretical introduction, or is it going to be practical? And then, how practical? And does it continue? I don't know if core curriculum means that everything in pre-primary goes across, but does the pre-primary introduction continue into primary all the way up? Because I don't see it other than coding and robotics, but entrepreneurship, and may I add finance? And I literally mean banking, learning how to invest, learning how to save for future, learning how not to spend all your money is really important and should be included. I don't know if um, the theoretical approach to teaching and learning to more practical approaches, what do I mean? When you look in the book, you realize that you speak about the project-based approach. It will not be the project-based approach in isolation. We want our children to have authentic experiences where they can visit museums, where they can find a real-life problem and use the mathematics and the English and the science and the social studies to solve the problem, reflect, question, inquire, make presentations. This is the way of many of the advances. It serves our children better when they're able to see the connection between all of the sub between and among all of the subjects that they're learning. The problems that we face in everyday life are not single problems, not only mathematics problems. To get here from wherever you came from, you had to look at time, you had to look at distance, you had to you know, think about the traffic. Is the traffic heavier during this time or that time? You have to look at all of the inputs to make decisions. We want our children to do the same. So no, it is not going to be fully theoretic, theoretical. Of course, there will be theoretical aspects, but we want it to be heavily practical. Another component is service learning. So we want our children to know what it means to serve at, an, uh, at a geriatric hospital, you know, to look after young children with supervision, of course, of, of the adults, right? They, they need to, to understand that life is education, that education is life. I'm going to let Dr. Denny now speak a bit about financial literacy. So Dr. Denny, over to you. Thank you, Chief. Yes, the Chief is right, and you are right. We recognize that non-traditional things like financial literacy are critical. Our children must do all of the things you said there if they are to lead a good life when they reach adulthood. So therefore, we are exposing them to a number of non-traditional areas which are going to be assessed not by pencil and paper test, but by seeing what competencies they have developed. What can they do? Can they make a plan for how they're going to save the 10 cents that they have worked for? So therefore, we are going to have a lot of different assessment modalities that tell us whether children have developed these competencies that we are focusing heavily on. We are also going to be looking at the multiple intelligences that children have, and we are going to be developing programs so that we can make use of what each child is good at. For instance, if you look through the booklet, when you get the opportunity to go through the booklet fully, you would see on page 11 as we talk in depth about the primary program. And I, I would like to say there was somebody earlier who, who talked about the primary program. We have only given you a snapshot. If you read the booklet, you would see a lot more things that we are going to do at each level. But on page 11, we've talked about the different pillars that we are going to be using to deliver 
uh, instruction at the primary level, we are going to be doing the numeric, the kinesthetic, the artistic, the scientific, the linguistic. And each child may not be good at every one of those, but each child is good at at least one of those. So we are going to reach all of them in that way. In terms of the coding and robotics, this is not theoretical at all. In fact, the government has spent, I believe it might be in excess of $10 million already, providing kits for every school in this country from our nursery schools. We have kits at the various level, the coding, the robotics kits, where all of our children can begin to explore and develop. We, the, the idea is that we want these children to be developers of technology, and therefore, we have to provide them with the tools to help them to become those developers. So you are making excellent points, and we agree with you on all of them, and we recognize that if we are going to ensure that our children can develop competencies, we obviously have to provide the resources that that development can take place. Thank you, Dr. Denny. Michelle, you had a second question. I, I need you to make it as concise as you possibly can. Concise as possible. Okay, um, this is about emotional intelligence and having three children and seeing the nightmare that I had to go through and how children can be fairly vicious. I think it's necessary from the pre-primary pre all the way up that there is a class in which it's, it's not a theoretical class again, but where the children actually have to group in twos with children that they don't speak with, with children that they don't hang with at lunch, with children that they might even not like and get to know. And this should be a class, a regular class, because there's a lot of bullying and you don't understand what the bullying's about. A lot of it is they don't know the other children or they just simply always want to hang with who they know, but it's necessary that you all include that in your curriculum. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I think there's consensus on that. Yeah. Thank you very much for your contributions. I'm seeing six persons on their feet. I just want to flag this, please. I'm going to transition to this side of the room, if you don't mind, to the gentleman in just a second. Uh, I want you to keep your contributions, if you can, just like two minutes, that would be great. And I want to direct your attention also, for everyone in the room, to the back of the booklet that you have. At the bottom, there is an email address there, info.educationtransformationunit at school.edu.bb. That is the email address to which you can send all of your written submissions, should you not have the opportunity to either express them fully or to raise them this evening. Mr. Lashley spoke earlier about all-night prayer meetings at church. This certainly is not one of those. And so our time will expire eventually, and I want to ensure you know you have this avenue to submit all of your contributions. Yes, sir. Two minutes. Go for it. Okay. Hello. Um, so two, two persons came up here trying to talk about students not being able to read, and I think I could shed some light on that because I wasn't able to read really until I get into secondary school. Okay, and that's because, also leads me to a point I want to make. You guys talk about learning methods, learning styles, right? And I do agree with them, but I have to answer your question. How do, exactly do you learn, right? What is the, what gave you the drive to go into the profession that you were in, right? You had that initial spark. Like, for example, some people might see a racing car and say, hey, I want to be into a mechanical engineer, right? And they watch all the videos on YouTube about mechanical engineering. But then when it comes now to be in the classroom, they still need to go pick up a book and read. They can't get all the information guessed from watching videos. So I think when we talk about learning styles, it should be more about 
what is our primary engagement? Like, what, where do we engage with first so that we can be motivated to really study all the other learning styles, like the reading, the kinesthetics, and all those. So that's my first point. And then my second point is that this education plan seems to be for today, like what is happening in the world today. But if you look back at 20 years ago, 2003, there weren't smart, smart, there were not any smartphones back then. They, we didn't even have Wi-Fi. Barely a few homes had high-speed internet. So my question is, what about tomorrow? So the plan shouldn't just be looking at how to improve education for what is present today, but what is coming tomorrow. Mr. Lashi talk about AI, how AI can be used in actual education. Those are my two points. Thank you so much, sir. I'll allow the table to respond, and then I'll go to my left for our next question. What is your name, sir? I don't really want to give it, but um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I couldn't read until I got into secondary school. But um, my name is Nigel, but yeah, Nigel, Nigel. Griffith. OK. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start with the last point first. <laughs> And you were saying that we shouldn't have an edu we shouldn't have a plan that focuses on today. And we made sure that when we put oh, forward I, say, I say not only focus on today, but uh -huh. also focus on tomorrow. Okay, right, yes, because we are focusing on tomorrow as well. And that's why it is so difficult, because we can't pin our hands, we can't put our finger on what tomorrow will look like. Mm. All we can do is vision and look at trajectories and use the best information. But one thing is very clear, and that is skills are enduring. Content changes from day to day, but skills are enduring. And this is why the emphasis in this education transformation is on the development of skills. Skills in learning um, how to handle self, skills in in terms of relationships, skills in terms of critical thinking, and cooperation, and, and that's why the plan focuses mostly on that. Now, the other part, the other point that you made with regard to uh, learning styles, literature has shown that children learn best when they are engaged. Mm -hmm. Children become engaged when they're interested. This is the reason why in this um, booklet and in the document on the website, we are proposing the use of student profiles that will indicate students' capabilities, skills, and interests. Right? Yes. That way, teachers will be able to see what interests Nigel? Hmm. What interests Jane? If Nigel is interested in a lot of cars, then I could understand why when I speak about dolls, Nigel isn't very interested. But when I think about the fact that Nigel likes cars and those kinds of things, I'm going to get a few passages for Nigel because I want Nigel at the end of the day to be able to read. So you made some very, very good points there, and I thank you very much for your contribution. Oh, um, can I guess say one last thing? Yes. What you guys say about having the profiles for the students, I know that that's going to cause a lot of headaches, because like, you have one child that likes animals, one child that likes motorsports, one child that likes planes, right? So I was saying like it'd be great if there's a database for teachers to pull information from. Like I can. Like, say, I write something about um, cars and airplanes. I'm a friend of mine, as of that, write something about. And teachers could go to that database and guess pull it from me. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, Nigel. Thank you so much. Uh, just before you begin, ma'am, a QR code is going to come up on screen. That is a QR code that allows you to scan and complete a survey. Again, another opportunity for you to make your input, to give your contributions. So I invite you to do that as well. Ma'am, to my left. Please feel free, just state your name and go ahead and make your contribution. If you can, please, just tilt that microphone down towards your mouth a bit so we don't miss any of what you would share.
Thank you so much for the assistance, sir. I'm not hearing you. Perhaps it's been switched off. In Hear the me testament. now? There you go. Yes, my name is Misha McLean. Um, I heard a lot about reading, and I will just say I agree with a lot of it. So I will go on to what has not been said. Thank you. CCSLC. I spent 28 years teaching secondary school. And I would like to know where that fits in the system. It's supposed to be from first to third. And I think that is, according to your system, junior college. Is CSCSC, CCSLC still ongoing? Two, training of teachers for inclusion of special needs. Um, in service training, um, there is you said you're going to include overseas universities. Um, I have some training with um, University of Nova Scotia, uh, Mount St. Vincent, and there is real training, which is now real tutoring, right? And who is going to be do the, do the training? Sorry. Who is going to do the testing of these students? for these different abilities. Thank you, Michelle. I also appreciate you keeping your questions so concise and clear. Giving the table a, an opportunity to respond. Yes, please go ahead, Mr. Jackman. Okay. As a serving principal, I'll take the CCSLC. Yes, originally we said first to third, but different schools have done different things with it. I've worked in a school where we recognize that it couldn't be done first to third. We used it a lot later, and we used it as a segue into CSEC. And surprisingly, doing it that way improved the CSEC performance at that particular school. One of the problems we've had with it is that people treat it as something to get out of the way. And we need to have people rethink because it does have benefits. It is the core of the CSEC syllabus. And if you use it that way, if you look at it from that approach that it is the core of the CSEC syllabus, then you don't overteach. You teach so that you are using it as a building block to the next level. Okay, your, your question um, related to the training of teachers for inclusion. Uh, I want to, to bring it to your attention that Erdiston Teachers Training College has a special module on special needs for every program, from the Bachelor of Education to the, to the Postgraduate Diploma in Education Secondary through to the Postgraduate Diploma in Educational Leadership. And there's a module as well taught in the evening program. What we want to do though, we want to ensure from here on in that our teachers, all of them across the system, have that opportunity for continuous professional development so that they're exposed to it. What we see creeping up a lot are children with exceptionalities, especially on the autism spectrum. And sometimes some of our teachers feel ill-equipped to handle these children. It is important, therefore, for us to have the continuous professional development programs that teachers can access so that they can be better equipped to deal with these children and refer them if necessary. Um, can I also add more teachers, smaller class size, more help? Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> and, and resources. Don't I, I underestimate paper. Preaching to the converted And, and Michelle, <laughs> before well you made. leave, if I can add to what the chief has said, we recognize that there are some areas in which we may not have the expertise that is required. So we are going to engage in interagency collaboration. So for instance, with our um, initial diagnostic testing and screening and things like that, we are collaborating with the Ministry of Health and Wellness. So wherever there is something that needs to be done and we don't have the expertise within the ministry, we are doing the collaboration. Uh, let me just add to that. Um, the screening should also include teachers. Mm. So it's diagnos diagnosing 
and screening. You're absolutely right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. I'm going to go now to the right side of the room in the interest of continuing as we have been going. And ma'am, thank you for your two-minute contribution. Incredibly grateful. Thank you. Good evening, head table, and good evening to my brothers and sisters. I'm Sandy Field Kelman, a Montessori educator and also a literacy specialist. Um, I'm going to use myself as, a, as an example um, to say that these new things that are going to be implemented are so important as opposed to academics. I just want to say that I was privileged to have done all these things in the book when I was a little girl. Thank God for the parents, that, the parents I had. So I teach sign language, lawn tennis, puppetry, et cetera, et cetera. So at school, I th thought that, my parents thought that it was more kinesthetic than visual but I actually ended up doing both. Now, what I want to say as an educator, and I'm going to keep it real, we're speaking about retraining teachers in our system. I had an experience this evening in the park where they had the landship um, rehearsal for Saturday, and there were seven teachers there, and I'm not knocking teachers, but I have to talk the truth okay, because I'm an advocate for young children and for people generally. It peeved me to hear what teachers said to those children because they were not doing what they wanted them to do. I'm saying if we're going to retrain teachers, we have to retrain our teachers the way they speak to children or people generally. I know it's a societal thing. The things that they... So when I came and in, got in... in I intervened in it because two of them were my children, brownies. I said, pardon me? You will apologize to those two children, all right? The language that they used, the adjectives, I will not repeat. And I'm saying if we are going to retrain teachers, we have to retrain them not because they got a, a degree in geography, English, physics, or mathematics. You've got to retrain how they speak. And it comes under the same EI. Okay, the way they speak to the children, all right? We know that maybe it came from home, all right? And also, their English. I am one, I am a sticker for the English language. Don't come and tell me, ground it, ah, down there. No, I'm sorry, because you're teaching my child, all right? I get very, very emotional at things like this. And there are teachers, don't come and tell me. When we were coming down in the bus, the teacher behind me, I could not believe the language she was using. So I am saying we have to look at that type of retraining. Okay, if you're going to teach the next generation or not, you're going to produce zombies, sorry to say. All right, the classes are too massive. You must have unit pause. In our Montessori teaching, we teach five and six children at a time. And obviously they get hands-on programs that they can learn. The classes, if you're teaching six children, I was telling the guy there just now, you will have children who can learn to read. You cannot teach 30 children in a classroom to read because they have loads of challenges on the spectrum of this and the spectrum of that. And I really want to see going forward that the classes are small unit pods, okay, the diagnostic testing, and the teachers have empathy when they are teaching the children regardless what subject, and they bring that in to the classroom. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Thank God. And, 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 and you have to know other things besides physics and maths and English and, and geography. So you take your well-rounded training you would have received when you were a young person. And that's why I continue to keep, keep on the cutting edge, edge of education. Sign language and English and all that. I cannot deal with in green, what we say in Barbados, green verbs. I cannot. I think so. Venice, I think so. Thank you. So I really want those to, things to be addressed. Thank you so much. And I will Thank give um, the chief education officer my Montessori thing that I have written, my thesis that I've written. Thank you very much. Thank you. And all thesis submissions, please, can come to info.educationtransformationunit at school.edu.bb. Any comments you'd like to make as it relates to teacher training or you believe that's been adequately covered already? Yes, we've covered, but I appreciate the comments. Thank you so much. To Tony Olton's um, comment earlier. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. 
very quickly. I'm sorry? Very quickly, the points that were raised there are the things that when we, as a committee met, when we started to flesh out this, those were some of the things that we considered and that is why teacher training and leadership training have become such a central point to this. Yeah, and, and to the point of no Bajan in schools, one, one of the things my mother always taught me is the, the sign of a good communicator is having the facility to understand when it's time to switch so that That's you're able right. to communicate effectively and fluently and adjust according to your audience and context. Yes, sir. You may go ahead and make your, your Thank you for your two-minute contribution as we have been on the theme of saying. Good night, everyone. My name is Dr. Scorbing, and I will use my presentation in the form of questions to the panel. Um, comments and probably a question. No school system, first one, can teach everything to everyone, ever. But I'm expecting that the system as outlined here, so adequately done, will be able to produce a child that can learn anything at any time. I'm presuming that that's your dream. And that's the only hope you have for teaching so many things that so many people want at so many different times. The system must be good enough that it can teach every student how to learn. That's the first thing. I'm not going to ask because I'm expecting as a foundational system, and therefore I'm not going to presume that you did not do it. Second question. I want you to outline for me a, 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 a scenario where the present first formers will be going through the next seven years. In your dream arrangement, I want you please to go through where they're going to move from the first form in the schools because it's 25. They're going to go to second form, third form, and then a new school. Could you go to a dream situation, please? I thought you were going to ask all the questions one time. No, 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 no. I, we, we have to go to it. Obviously, I wouldn't be unfair to you like that. <laughs> all right. So this is 2023-2024. We have first formers. They will have a year of the standard education, the traditional education. Between 2024 and 2025, they would have moved to second form. They will continue with the traditional mode of education. We are proposing, proposing that from 2025, those third form, those to be third formers will either remain in their school or transition to another school. Let me explain to you the basis of the transition. As part of the proposal, we said we would like to see a two-tier structure where there is a junior college of excellence and a senior college of excellence. This means that some schools will be assigned as junior colleges of excellence and others senior colleges of excellence. If the child is at a school that will remain, let's say a junior college of excellence, and that child is supposed to go into third form, that child will continue at that school. However, if the child is at a school that we designate as a senior college of excellence, then that child will have to transition out of that school into a junior college of excellence. We are proposing that that happens based on the primary school. Remember we spoke about the catchment school and the primary school feeder system? So let me, let me, let me give an example. If, let's use Charles F. Broom. So let's say the child is at Queen's College 
but went to school at Charles F. Broome. And the Springer Memorial School is now a, a junior college of excellence. It means that that child will continue in the third form at the Springer Memorial School because it's a junior college of excellence. But if the Springer Memorial School is a senior college of excellence, then what would have to happen is that the child will have to transition to the junior college of excellence that is close <laughs> to the Charles F. Broome that they went to school at. You see what I'm saying? Very well. So, so that, that is the, the breakdown of, of how we are proposing this transition. Thank you very much, ma'am. That's clear. Obviously, third form series, two years from now, is really the, 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 the mess. I, I want to use that word, may start. I don't expect it to, but you have to have things in place to make sure it doesn't start. And therefore, that two years from now, of course, you'll have it all going well. Because the next question is this. How do you intend to tackle our sociological problem that affects education so much? Our good friend there, my good friend, will be able to explain it to, you, to everybody here. Where you have the St. Lucie's Secondary Syndrome Versus, I'm not even going to say Harrison College, I'm just going to say the Dighton Griffith dichotomy. Where you have a feeling about St. Lucy and a feeling about Dighton Griffith, which has absolutely nothing to do with the child. How do you intend to tackle that in the scheme of things? So, sir, I'm going to have to ask that you make that your last question. Oh, no, sir. I, I, my two minutes didn't go up. With all due respect, uh, the persons up there spoke, and I only spoke for um, one half of a minute, sir. One half of a minute. You can't take away my time, sir. I, I have to beg for my time. I'll allow you to make a response after the chief has responded to your Thank question. Thank you very much. So you mean you're counting her time as part of my, my, my time too, sir? No, sir. Okay, but then you only, I've only had one. But this is actually part of your time now, though. Yes, this is, I, I, I'm begging for that to be deferred, however. You're quite right for this one. Madam I'm Chief, sorry, Madam. please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Saul. We all know that change is painful. It is painful because we have to transition from how we normally operate to a new way of operating. It therefore calls for a paradigm shift. I'm talking about change in general. It calls for a paradigm shift. How are we going to do this? We know that in Barbados, there is a strong perception, as you correctly said, about some of our schools. Well, all of our schools. They would say that school A is not the same as school B. School A is a good school, while well, school B is a bad school. What we intend to do as part of this education transformation, if the proposals go through, is to ensure that there is equity. Not only talk about it, but to ensure that there is equity across schools in terms of the physical infrastructure, in terms of the human resources, in terms of the digital infrastructure, and many other things. I'm not going to take too long. But the thing is to make sure that there is equity. We have to start making steps in that direction as soon as the proposals are accepted, right? To make sure that Bajans can see that we want to actually walk the talk. There are plans in train right now because there are some schools that need to be fixed. There are plans in train right now to upgrade certain schools so that teaching and learning is con conducive. All right? So we know we have to do a lot of work in terms of changing people's mindsets. So we're going to make the steps to do so. I hope I've if I may add a bit to yeah, what sure. the chief has said, we also have to focus attention on the work that is done in all of our schools right now. 
there is a perception in Barbados that some schools are not as good as others. But when you go beneath the surface, you see the quality of the work that is being done in some schools, and you see that those schools are, in fact, adding more value than other Correct. schools whom we So one of the things we have to do is make sure that the whole country knows what these schools are doing. And, and one of the, the, the flaws some of the schools that people refer to as bad schools is that they don't sell themselves. Returning fits from other schools, they kept them in the fear for another year or two years, gave them a new uniform, and you wouldn't believe the results they got. But that's not what This question, quickly, I'm, I'm not going to take your time though. How do you. Go right ahead. Sure. The other two that I'm here, but I will leave them because he was there. Yeah. Spec these recommendation that these subjects like geography and so on and so forth follow a five-year program. Do you expect the syllabus to be taught? Let, let me ask, let, let, let you ask. Um, program, explain. is supposed to follow a five-year program um, in a normal course of I know what I'm saying that the recommendation um, by CXC. Is there any plan to follow recommendations in it may be another subject? And therefore, is that in the planning or is that you have to think about? I'm not expecting to have thought of everything. Okay, as an examination body, they, like any examination body, Look at the needs of the country, the needs of the society, and cater their curriculum to match it. Now, we are talking about a shift in the way that we plan to deliver education, and there will be shifts in the way that assessment is done and the way that examination is done as well. So, for instance, at the senior uh, colleges, we're looking at a multi-pronged approach in terms of examination and examination bodies. We are looking, of course, at diverse curricula. Uh, diverse curricula, which, as one of our um, contributors said earlier, we want to look at a practical approach, a real uh, life learning type of approach, a real relevance to real life um, existence. So or what we are going to be looking at is examination bodies, examination methodologies that also fit into that shift that we are trying to make. And while I'm on that, um, earlier you asked about uh, what is our dream of a particular situation, and I think you were being a little bit, you, you pointed to it's very specific. So I want to also assure you that we've been looking at Pitching forward, looking at those year levels that may be most affected by a change in education, the way that we deliver it, we've been looking at that same third form, how they're going to, to transition. It's going to be a, a swift change for them, swifter than for the others. They have a more gradual um, approach to it. Looking at that four, a little bit as as you say, in their fourth and fifth year of CSEC, and you're introducing them to a system where they may have other choices in terms of examination bodies. They may have other choices. So we're looking at those and looking at things like career guidance, looking at um, all those things in the system that we're trying to build up so that they can be better supported when that change takes place. Based upon my experience with EduTech 2000, this is and critical. Yeah, this will be your closing Thank contribution. Yes, this is my closing Thank you statement. so much, sir. Appreciate you. EduTech 2000 was a beautiful program with a lot of the same objectives and glorious ideas and ideals that you have outlined again. The problem is education did not believe in it. So I'm asking the Ministry of Education, Madam Minister and Madam CEO, to really believe in this project if you want it to work. Because I do believe that it are common interests has long overstayed its welcome and needs to go. 
But the Ministry of Education and by extension the government of Barbados and by extension the people of Barbados must be taught to believe in this system or it will fail. Thank you very much. Strong point. Thank you so much, Mr. Corbin. Um, I want to be mindful of a few things. We have three people on their feet and they've been on their feet for some time. I'm also three and a half, somebody who's almost on their feet. And, and I'm also mindful of how we are progressing throughout the evening. We'd like to round off our discussions this evening by 9.30. And so with three people on their feet, I just want you to be mindful of that. Remember, you will always have the open door of sending your contributions to the email address, which is going to come up on screen, is now on screen, so that you can send any contributions you may not be able to make in person to that email address. But I want us to be mindful of that as we proceed to our round off time at 9.30. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to my right as I went to my left just now. Go right ahead, sir. Please give us your name and make your contribution in two minutes or less. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tariq Thornhill, and I just want to direct my questions to the minister and the panel by asking firstly, or suggesting really for us to think about these names in which in Barbados we would have seen global success. Rihanna Fenty, R Ryan Brathwaite, Jalon Samuels, Darian King, Matthew Wright, Shadia Williams, Jonathan Jones, Shane Brathwaite, DJ Puffy, Kobe Abridi, Miles Gittings, and a few others, and want to understand if the average child who would have seen these, this success within the last decade comes and says, okay, I want to be that, or even a Lionel Messi, who would have emulated Diego Maradona's success, I want to be placed in that type of environment. How does this current transformation actually foster that type of success? Good night, sir. First and foremost, that is the thing that we built in. The academies of excellence, the, the senior colleges of excellence are catering to that. If you are, want to be the best jockey in the world, we may not be able to do it in the school, but we'll be able to partner with somebody, which means that you'll be able to leave the school and go to a stable where you can get that done, along with doing the core things that you are expected to do. We are also looking at flexibility across the senior academies where you've gone to Academy X because you, there's a program there that you like, but you need something that is being spe specialized at another country. And we are trying to build out timetable and curricula so that you'll be able on a specific day to go across to the next academy and take that subject. We are trying really hard in this system to cater to everything. We are also pushing the concept of competency base where you are learning the skill and building out the theory after the skill as opposed to sitting down and getting a theory framework, which we are very good at at Barbados. You can tell a guy how to hammer a nail, but he can hammer a nail, he the finger. Because we've never allowed him to hammer a nail, so we want to change that. And that's from the primary level all the way up? Or? From the primary level all the way up. That is why we are introducing Project Base at the primary and junior academies. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I'm going to go to my left now. Ma'am, you can go ahead. Thank you, good night. My name is Melina Simmons. On page four, you state, one of the barriers to student success is insufficient parental involvement. My question is, how do we intend to overcome that? And not just parental involvement, because we know the school is just a microcosm within the society, and we've had other people sort of referencing it already. But the question is, what is the plan to overcome this thing? Because we know the little children go home and they say, oh, I learned this in school. And the parents do the complete opposite and just dash their spirits. What's the plan for that? Simple question. Thank you. Thank you for your question, ma'am. Thank you for the question, ma'am. And you're absolutely right that we have to make sure that we have that connection between the school and the home because we are not going to succeed without it. Now, school and the community. So therefore, I would have talked about interagency collaboration. And one of the things that we propose to do is have significant 
interagency collaboration with the agency of the Ministry of People Empowerment, who are responsible for a lot of peer education. We also know if you are aware that the system would have developed a student the student council you, do you know that there's a national student council now and uh, we have engaged the executive of the national student council who have given us a 10 point plan as to how they propose to work with us to advance education transformation one of the points that they have included is working with parents and their rationale for including that is they are our parents. They will listen to us. So they want to take the lead in working with parents. And we believe we should let them do so because children influence their parents. So we have, that is one of the we're going to work, but there are a number of other programs that we are also working with the Ministry of People Empowerment in order to get parents involved. We recognize that every parent wants the best for his or her. I have been in education nearly 50 years, and I have never come across a parent who not interested in having his or her child succeed. Some of them are not able to articulate that well. But as long as they see that you are prepared to work with them, many of them are prepared to work with you. And therefore, we recognize that we have to make the effort to build the bridge with not only the parents, but the communities in which they live as well. Because some parents, may, you may not be able to get through to them, but there may be other persons in the communities whom they respect and who will be able to get through to them. Thank you so much, Dr. Denny. I was about to come to you, sir, but there was a question that I missed a bit earlier on this side of the room. I think we are getting a microphone that we can have that question submitted uh, for consideration. Just give us one second so that we can arrange that, please. And then, sir, I'm going to come to your question immediately after. Thank you so much for your patience. Yeah. We've been doing well with the two-minute question, so I'm grateful for your continued cooperation. Um, I appreciate the fact that you are able to pass the mic to me. This is a good example of utilizing accommodations to assist persons who are unable to participate in the way that everyone else is. Um, I'm the parent of an autistic child. My name is Danielle Lifcott. And this is more of a suggestion. It will take a lot of time, I admit, and it will be expensive, but it is an investment in our children and in our society at large. My suggestion would be that the government of the country that we invest in the training of trained counselors, psychologists, to be assigned to every single primary and secondary school in this island, not just for the children to have access, but also for the teachers themselves. Because we all talk about, oh, the children have all these stresses, they have all these issues, and they do need to have someone there that they can confide in who can recognize the various disabilities issues that would affect children and cause them to fall through the cracks in our education society. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that the majority of our teachers now, they may have the book learning. They say, yes, we've done these classes, we know what these the check marks that we're supposed to tick off to pick up on any issues that students may be having. But 
what is there on the notes in the books, that does not equate to what they experience in real life. And teachers themselves have their own issues that they're dealing with. And then they have to come into classrooms with 30 plus children, all of whom have their own issues that they have to cope with. And the teacher is now stretched 30, 35 different directions. And they're expected to lead the children, train the children, and pick up on every issue that each child has. So that's why I'm saying we need to have counselors, psychologists posted at each school. Persons that can aid the teachers who might be able to pick up on something after they've had time interacting with the children, the teachers, the parents, to say, hmm, I'm noticing something with the children in this class. They can liaise with the teachers, liaise with the parents, and see if maybe we need to take this child in for specialized testing. This person, from my experience dealing day to day with persons who have various disabilities, who have the various neurodivergent tendencies, I actually have the lived experience. I can point out this child may have this issue, talk to the teacher, and then have that person referred through the ministry to various counseling services or to the development center and such like. Thank you so much for that contribution. I believe it is well received by the team. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, let me come over to the gentleman who is here. Okay. Miss Boyce, I've noted you've taken seat in the line. Mm -hmm. I'll come to you after we have finished the lady who stands. Go right ahead, please, sir. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is I have a question more about the transition the proposal from the year 2025. This change is taking take effect. One of your previous um, persons asked about your dream situation with a first former. Say you have a second or third former now that's at a senior academy of excellence. In 2025, they're in fourth or fifth form. But their school knows something that is, is doing other subjects that they're not interested in or they have been studying for CSC. How will this be accommodated? And will schools, the senior academy of excellence, Currently, will they be running like two separate programs at the same time to those children that would have gone past the, I guess, transition in 2025 but that are not in first form now and we're still under the old CSC system? system. Very good question, Dr. Anderson Yearwood. Yes. This system that we are proposing is characterized by flexibility. One, we also seek to cater to the student. So we're not going to stick to rigid structure for children to be herded through the structures. In the event that we have fourth or fifth formers having to transition from their existing school to a new school, there would need to be parallel programs is running. Mm -hmm. One that caters to the Senior College of Excellence program mm -hmm. and the other that allows the child to continue in the CXC program. Mm -hmm. But that child will still have the option to come over into the Senior College of Excellence program. Mm -hmm. The Senior College of Excellence, we are proposing two stages between 14 and 15 years old, that's the fourth and fifth formers um, of whom you're speaking. And the second stage, between 16 and 18 years old, which is optional. Mm -hmm. So a child can stay on. A child can say, well, look, I am doing CX. I'm supposed to do CXC now. Or the parent might say, you know, my child is supposed to do CXC now, but I don't really feel that he's going to get back many CXCs. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for him to transition into a particular school of excellence with his interests. Accommodations will be sought for this particular child and the child will be given extra time to complete the Senior College of Excellence program. So at every turn, remember I said we're asking certain questions. Is it fair? Is it inclusive? Is it relevant? Is it modern? Fair to the fourth and the fifth form, we have 
allow them to continue with the CXC program if they desire to do so, and we have to make the provision for them to complete the Senior College of Excellence program if they desire to do so. Thank you very much. Can you make it very quick? Yes, please. Right ahead. Um, this is in relation to the this booklet here, the reimplementation, the FAQs. Yeah. Um, there's a question: What if my child is equally interested in two colleges of excellence? What options will be made available? You state that students will be permitted classes across the SCE system. Um, are any cons what considerations are you all? Are taking what do y'all use as the parameters for choosing the SE, SEEs and their location to avoid children being disadvantaged due to the, where they live? Because you see, do classes at two colleges. I would think that that might be challenging, say, if you want to do tourism and you want to do law or business, and there, say, one is in St. Lucie, one is in Christchurch. Um, I, I just want to know what is the process to, to accommodate the proposal here. So you're asking the question against the backdrop that the child will have to physically move mm -hmm. from one senior college of excellence to another. Yeah. What we are proposing are virtual offerings for the senior colleges of excellence. Mm -hmm. And uh, the modules mm -hmm. which the students may decide to take may not happen within the 93 framework to which we are accustomed. We can have offered in the late evening or early morning, or it could be a synchronous module as well, that the child can get up early, four day morning, one o'clock, two o'clock, complete a module. So while we will allow some children to be able to, if, to, to move between colleges of excellence, if um, they so desire, we still have virtual offerings okay. for our children to access at different times of the day, right? Remember, we have the student at the center. It's all about catering to them so that they can reach their full potential. Okay. If I can add to what the chief is saying, if, if there is one lesson we learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, is that we cannot go back. We have to embrace the remote modality as well and blended modalities. Mm -hmm. So that is how we will be able to accommodate a number of children who are going to be offering multiple modalities of delivery. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Denny, and thank you very much for your questions. Academic and those who are athletic that we celebrate all talents, whether they're scientists, they're artists, they're dramatists, they're poets, they have cooking skills, they're good at singing. We need to celebrate the talents of every child because what has happened when we push those who are academic and we push those who are athletic, those who feel that like they are not important start to give trouble. I see it every single day. And we make them feel as if they're insignificant. And then we wonder why there's so much problems within this country. It starts from way down here. Appreciate the of every child. I also want to say that we give the same exam to every single child when every child is not at the same level. This is a problem to me. You have a class with 20 children. You want to teach them the same way. You go on the board, you write, you have the book, you have an exam for it. Let me give you an example. I have a question like, complete the sentence. The child may be able to complete the sentence, but when they see the word complete, they don't know what it is. A child might be able to add, but when they see the word addition, they don't know what to do. A child might be able to subtract, but when they see the word subtraction, they don't know that because they don't recognize the word subtraction. Are, I find that exam trying to target high Those who are strong, 7%, 10%, 20%, and finally, children are sick. How are we going to target children? We want to teach all of these children the same way, but we need to come up with creative ways 
of targeting children with all of these problems because we might make them feel or they're done. Because let me tell you something about our education system. We want to knock it right, but take the slowest children in Barbados and put them in America and they'll be at the top of the class because our, ed our education system is the top of the top. I don't care. I am a Barbadian. I defend my country, okay? So that's what I have to say tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for your contributions, Reverend Bob. It was a sermonette tonight and not a whole sermon. sermon. We're incredibly grateful to you. Your contributions have been noted. And finally, Miss Boyce. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, Madam Chief, Madam Director, my colleagues and parents here as well. I just want to commend Madam Chief Director for the tremendous job you have done so far. I don't think you are getting enough praise for that. But since I am a principal of a school, I know about praise. And I know what it does to the children, and I know what it does to adults. So therefore, we need to do much more of that. I want to say, I rise to speak to, I'm putting a plug for early childhood education. That is my specialization. I'm the principal of the, the Maria Holden Nursery at Sharon. And I was born to teach. This is something I was born to teach. That each time I go to the school, and I have been there for 46 years now, 47 next year, I'm at the door of retirement, but I still have that burning fire and desire to do my best whenever I report for duty. And this is something I would want in any coming into my purview. One of my um, seniors is here with me, and I would want to say at the secondary school and at the primary school, if you adopt strategies that we use in the nursery department, you would not have those problems in secondary school, because we have to take children as they come. Right now, I have a section of autistic children, children with hearing problems, children who have all kinds of behavioral problems, but we take them. And you know why they are with me? Because Dr. Campbell, God bless her, is sending them to the school, and I am not refusing them, because everybody should be given an equal opportunity to succeed, and everyone is equal in my book. Therefore, Madam Chief and Madam Director, you're going forward to 25 years, 50 years when we are gone. If you are developing this uh, domain of education, and as our colleague said, we're looking 25 years, you have to strengthen early childhood education. This is the success of the education system, not the school of excellence. You ain't get there yet. You have to start at the beginning. My gross with you, Madam Denny, you know we go back very many years, is that I am not hearing early childhood education, care and development enough in these consultations. I am hearing about school of excellence. I am hearing about transfer at the, the, the class fours. We gotta get to class four before we can transfer. So therefore, where is early childhood education on your map? I am not hearing enough of it. I want to say as well that there's an, an anomaly in our system where there are three-year-olds and four-year-olds in daycare. Now, you know, in Barbados, we call everything nursery. You call the school at which I am I'm, I'm, I'm head. These are three and four. Three and four-year-olds are nursery school children. Children below that are not nursery school children, but they go to nursery and everybody say daycare. Daycare is a real word for them. They're not in nursery, they're at daycare. So let's get our terminologies right. So many times they're calling me at school and they want to know how much they're going to pay. They want to know how much whatever. They don't pay, well, that make me lose my job. However, what I am saying to you, Madam, Madam Director and Madam Chief, we are going forward to 25 years to 50 years. What are we doing with these three-year-olds in daycare? That program is different to mine. 
to all the nursery schools in Barbados which you oversee. Those programs are not ours, but they're coming to us at three and four. Get them out of childcare. Put them under one ministry called the Ministry of Education. That is what we need to do. Being the president of Early Childhood Education Association for many years, since the 90s, there was a 2000 um, conference, a Caribbean conference, at the Dover Convention Center. You know, that's, that's no longer there. But Miss Denny, you know about that conference. We proposed that all through, throughout the Caribbean. Put anything dealing with early childhood education under the same auspices, which will be the Ministry of Education. We need to, if we're gonna give equality to all, we can't have some over there sleeping and doing whatever, and then the ones in the nursery school, the good ones are like mine. My school is an excellent school. Excellent. We are galloping. We are galloping. We talk about diversity and integration, but that's the only way to teach children, by integrating subjects. You have to show them the meaning of science. All I did when I was at, at school was copy notes from a board and writing. No, my children go outside. My children belong to 4-H. The youngest children in Barbados, called the Green Spouts, belong to the 4-H club, and they have to do their practical work. And every day, they go to their orchard, which we developed at the school when the school was being designed. I particularly designed an orchard with many plants and fruit, and they have to go there and they know the names and they pick the fruit and we do whatever. The same type of program using art every day because the children learn through creative means. And Madam Chief, you're all talking about creativity. My artist is right here. This is a trained artist with papers. She isn't like me who I could, I could paint and so on, but she's a trained artist. Every day the children must be concerned with their easel painting, their brush stroke, and, and so on. How are we going to get them to write? Because that's all Barbadian parents are interested in, you know. They come to September and what do you exercise book and writing? No, please. Muscle in the finger first before you can write. <laughs> Madam Chief and Madam Director, get into the parents' heads. Educating a whole child is. And we must educate the whole child at nursery level infant level, at primary level, the great George Lamming once said that the most important school is the primary school. You know, he has put the nursery and primary together. Primary school, if you don't learn anything in the primary school, you don't have any skills are we giving the children. Only to write a copy back with somebody else says. That is nothing about education. That is parroting. Thank you, Miss Boyce. I am saying to you, I am saying to you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Creativity is at the heart and the success of this program. And Madam Chief and Madam Director, please let me hear early childhood education, care and develop education, care and development more often from tonight. I want to hear those words spoken. What I want to say to you as well, a recommendation to bring special needs closer to the nursery schools. Because there's lots of programs we, we work on. The way we teach is the same way that the special needs children should be taught. Bring them closer to the nursery school. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Boyce. I believe I can invite... Dr. Denny and the Chief to make any final contributions in response to what Ms. Boyce said, but also generally yeah. as we bring this evening's pr proceedings to a, to a close. I, I want to say very facetiously to Mrs. Boyce that we, we were calling it pre-primary, but we will listen to you and call it early childhood development and care. But <laughs> seriously now, Every point you made is why we have said there must be universal access
for all children three to five years old because we recognize that there is a set of children out there who are not getting the exposure that is required to build a solid foundation for formal learning when they get to the primary school level. And that is a critical thing that we must do. Also, we have been talking about the play-based curriculum and making the point, the very point that you have made there, that the children must develop these physical and other skills before they are ready for the formal exercises that you find at primary school. So you, you know that you are preaching to the converted. But if you want us to call it early childhood, we will call it instead of pre-primary. <laughs> Pardon? Mm -hmm. Why? We, we are just using the international definition for those levels. We, we, are, not, we are not talking, so to speak, calling it basic. We are using the international designation as set out by um, UNESCO. Right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much, Dr. Denny. Uh, Madam Chief, any closing thoughts? Yes. This was a wonderful evening. I thank you so much for sharing with us. It was good food for thought, and I'm sure that Dr. Denny, the team, and I will engage in robust discussion <laughs> with regard to how we can include your suggestions in our draft, our final draft. So thank you so very much. Mr. Jackman, Mr. Luke, any final thoughts? Once again, I want to thank you all for coming out and for making your submissions. We started at a point, and it is evolving, and we are thankful that you are adding to that evolution. Yeah. I'd like to echo that thought as well. We are really grateful for all of your contributions. Those are things that we've been considering, and most of them already, and there have been some additional things we feel that can add more value to we have been creating as well. I also see lots of teachers in the audience as well, and educators, former and current, and that also bodes well for us. Uh, we need to consider some of the benefits and some of the possible drawbacks, so I'd like to see even more contribution from teachers and educators and principals as well. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. And finally, Minister McCarney, any closing thoughts? Just wanted to say thank you to all of you. This has been an exciting time for us, and I really am grateful for some of the suggestions, all of the suggestions, in fact. The social and emotional learning not only being um, applied when it relates to students, but being applied to the teachers and the leaders as well was something that we have not heard before. Um, there were some other suggestions with regards to how we treat to AI. Again, something new and exciting. So there are about four or five other things that this is the first time we're hearing them. And so we want to say thank you for the new ideas that are coming up. Our next um, public consultation will be at Princess Margaret School. That is next week, November the 8th. And um, I would like to encourage you to encourage your family and your friends and other educators to join us and give the kind of input that you gave tonight. We can only get better with your support. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And before we all leave, a few housekeeping matters for your attention. You can turn your attention to the screens. There's some important information coming up there. And while you do that, I want to give honor where honor is due. The videography and streaming, thank you so much to the MRD team, the Media Resource Department, audio, 
AccuSounds, digital screen operating, AccuSounds as well. Lighting, we're grateful to Intelligent Lighting. Graphic design, banners and digital graphics, Geo Romare Designs. Artistic and creative direction, Dr. Denise Charles. Event production, Randy Eastman ushers, transformation unit staff, rapporteurs or note takers from the admin staff and all media houses present and of course, I've said the best for last. I'm grateful, indebted to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for your presence here this afternoon, this night, and of course, for all of your rich contributions. Remember, you can scan that QR code to access the survey to make your contributions, and at the back of your programs that you are going to take with you for future consideration, you will find the email address to which you can send all of those theses that you've worked so hard to develop. My name is Raphael Saul, incredibly grateful to have hosted you this evening. Do have a wonderful evening and travel safely. The Ministry of Education, Technological and Vocational Training wants your thoughts and questions about the recently launched proposals to education transformation in Barbados. Island-wide public consultation meetings 